Amen. It's good to see you all. Uh, we are in Romans chapter 9, uh, 9 through 11, and we're sort of going towards the end of Romans chapter 11. And uh, Romans chapter 9 through 11 is, uh, is a very theological piece right in the sort of in between, in the center of Romans, where Romans chapter 1 through 8 is laying out Paul's vision of the gospel. And then from chapter 12 on, he's going to talk about how we ought to live in light of the gospel, many practical exhortations that are found in chapter 12 and following. But then in chapter 9 through 11, deals with a particular issue, having expressed just how uh, nothing can separate us from the love of Jesus Christ, that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And concluding with that beautiful Romans chapter 8, Paul deals with this difficult thing. If, if we can have such confidence in the gospel, how can we trust this if the promises of the Old Testament to the people of Israel seems like it has failed? And so he's dealing with this issue of Israel's unbelief. Are they not God's chosen people? And what has happened to them? And so if we are God's new chosen people, the church, both Jew and Gentile, then how can we trust that God will be faithful to the end? And Paul's argument is God has been faithful and God will be faithful and God's word does not fail. And he explicitly say this in Romans 9, 6, but it is not as though the word of God has failed for not all who descended from Israel belong to Israel. And the rest of the uh, chapters 9 through uh, 11 deals with this, uh, speaking about predestination and the idea of election in chapter 9, the necessity of faith in chapter 10, and then talking about the future of Israel, where in the end that God's plan would be fulfilled. And it's, uh, there's a much debate about exactly what it means, but that all Israel will be saved. Okay, that's in verse, chapter 11, verse 26. But in this uh, two verses that were read for us today, verses 11 through 12, it lays out for us really nicely uh, this theme of what God is doing with Israel. And I want to bring uh, some, some things out for us today, which is, who is Israel? That's my first question. Who is Israel? So, or what is Israel? So for not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel. That's in chapter 9, verse 6. So who is this Israel that is being talked about in chapter 9 through 11? Uh, because uh, 12 times in Romans, and they all happen to occur in uh, chapters 9 through 11, the word Israel occurs in 9 through 11. It occurs nowhere else. In at least in the book of Romans, it does occur. Israel or Israelite, Israelites occurs 500 or 2,507 times in the ESV version of the Bible. It's a common word. Another word that is often used is Jew or Jewish, so forth. And in Romans, verse chapters 1 through 3, it often uses the word Jew, Gentile, Jew and Gentile, and so forth. But then uh, I wanted to really take some time in this uh, sermon today to lay out to you who is Israel that we're talking about. And some of it might be very basic information, but uh, I want to review this for all of us. Um, so who is Israel? Number one, Israel is a person. Israel is a person. And Israel is used in different ways. And the three different ways that I have it used here is uh, Israel is a person. Israel is Jacob. Jacob's name was changed to Israel in Genesis 32, 28, where uh, Jacob, uh, in the, at nighttime, grappling with an angel or angelic being, that he, he is wrestling with this, uh, wrestling with God. And this angel is more than an angel. He is the angel of the Lord. This, is it an angel? Is it God himself? It's hard to know, but he's wrestling with God. And, you know, God could beat Jacob any time, but he allows Jacob to wrestle him. And then, you know, he wounds his sort of hip. 
And, uh, but he's still holding on. He would not let the Lord go. And, and God changes his name to Israel, which means that he strived with God and prevailed. So Israel means to strive with God or struggle with God, or you can even say wrestle with God. So Israel in his very name means someone who strived with God or wrestled with God and prevailed. And this is not to say that Israel is the one who could, be, Jacob is someone who can beat up God or wrestle God as greater than God, but he, he is the one who, uh, you know, in the very difficult situation, he held on to God. He's the one who wrestled with God. Jacob is the grandson of Abraham. Uh, so Abraham is the great-grandson of a man named Eber. Uh, the word Eber is where we get the word Hebrew from. So Hebrews, like the, the people, the Hebrew people, when you refer to that, is, is really talking about the descendants of Eber and the most prominent one was Abraham. So we, we, you can call it the Abramites or something like that, but we don't call it that. We call them Hebrews, the Hebrews, because uh, Abraham identified as a, as a Hebrew uh, through his great-grandfather named Eber. We don't know hardly anything about him, Eber, but we know that the Hebrew name was taken from this person who was a grand, uh, grand, great-grandfather, uh, of Eber. And it's interesting, from Noah to Eber is four generations, and from Eber to Abraham is another four generations. So he stands right in the middle between Noah and Abraham. That's just a fun fact, but uh, Israel is a person. That's number one. Number two, Israel is a people. So Israel, when we think of Israel, you can call Jacob Israel, but basically the idea is that through this person, Jacob, who was the son of Isaac, who was the son of Abraham, he became the patriarch. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Jacob's name changed to Israel. Jacob had 12 sons. The 12 sons become 12 tribes. There's a little complication with half tribes and so forth, but let me not get into that right now. But 12 sons, 12 tribes of Israel. And out of that 12 tribe of Israel, there is a specific tribe, the fourth tribe, the fourth son, Judah, who become the line of the kings, the Davidic line. And through him, Judah, the line of David, the line of Jesus, is the Messiah. But today we know of Israel or people who are, you know, of that descendant, we call them Jews. And that's what the Bible calls it as well, the Jews, the Jews and the Gentiles. Gospel was first for the Jews, then for the Gentiles. The, the name Jews... Uh, in Korean, actually, it would be helpful because in Korean, Jews are called Yudein, right? The people of Judah, <laughs> right? So who are these people? They are people who are descendants of Judah. So Judah, Eber is where we get Hebrew. Judah is where we get Jew. So this is just facts. But so th this is why Israel, Hebrew, Jew are, are sort of related because in sort of as a people, they are all descendants of Eber, of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And through Jacob, there's a particular line of Judah that is preserved. That's not the only tribe that is preserved. We know Levites were preserved and the Benjamites were preserved. Paul was, a, he was from the tribe of Benjam Benjamin and so forth. But um, Israel is a people chosen by God, made promises to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, reiterated for three generations, and then in the fourth generation, they become a people. And then Israel becomes a nation. 
After 430 years or so of slavery in Egypt, it is through Moses that God rescues the people of Israel. They were a people, they were a tribe, tribal people. But God calls them out of Egypt and calls them to worship at the mountain. And Exodus 20 is one of the places where the Ten Commandments, after being rescued out of Egypt, they're going to the mountain of God, the Mount Sinai, and they, Moses is going to receive the Ten Commandments to establish this kingdom. And in Exodus 19, verse 6, 5 and 6 particularly, let me read that for you. If you turn with me to Exodus 19, before the law is given, this is what is said, what God says to Moses. And now, therefore, in chapter 19 of Exodus, verse 5 and 6, Now, therefore, if you indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples. For all the earth is mine. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. And these are the words that you shall speak to the people of Israel. And so... Starting with Moses, Israel, given the law, becomes a nation. They're not just merely a people, they become a nation. And this nation wanders in the wilderness for 40 years before they enter the promised land through Joshua. And after Joshua comes the judges, where through prophets and priests and judges, God rules this kingdom this people, they're not a kingdom yet. They don't have a king, but they are a people that is being formed into a nation. And then the people are wanting to be like other nations, and they call Samuel, the priest, to be uh, for a king. They ask for a king. And so God raises up Saul, and Saul was the first king, but he is the king after man's own heart it's you can say Saul even though he was chosen by God to be king he was what man wanted Saul failed and David the second king he was he failed too but he was a man after God's own heart and it was through the second king David that God would continue the line of the Messiah and Solomon was his, was the third king the son of David and he was the one who built the temple. And this all, David's reign was around 1000 BC. So Abraham was about 2000 BC. David is around 1000 BC. And Jesus Christ is um, 1 AD. And then um, we have um, where we live today, about 2000 years. So many people uh, who, who think about the end of the end of the world might say, you know, it's been from the promise of Abraham 2,000 years before Christ, Christ right in the middle of history, and then now, is there something going on? I'm not here to predict. I'm not here to set a date, but who knows? Um, but it's important to know this history because more than all the specific details, Israel has been preserved for uh, if you go back to Abraham, 4,000 years. If you go back to Moses, it's about 3,400 years until Moses. Or if you go back to David, 3,000 years. If you go back to Christ, 2,000 years. Israel, as a people, have been preserved They've had many times they look like they would be destroyed. But I would say one argument for the Bible is actually the preservation of the is Israel as a people or the Jews. And so a little bit of this history is important to know. But uh, after Solomon was a guy, Solomon's son, Rehoboam, and Rehoboam was a foolish king. And uh, I won't get into all the story, but it's, it's an interesting story how he made some foolish choices and listened to his young 
young advisors instead of the older, wiser advisors. And the kingdom of David was split in two. So the northern kingdom uh, and then the southern kingdom, which was the kingdom of Judah, and the northern kingdom was called the kingdom of Israel. And the northern kingdom uh, was more syncretistic in terms of how they related to other gods and other religions and where Judah was a little more faithful, though they were uh, had their times of failures as well. The northern kingdom was destroyed in 722 BC by the Assyrian world power. And then the southern kingdom was destroyed. The temple was destroyed in 586 BC by the Babylonians. And though Israel was utterly destroyed by these world powers by 586, where the people of Israel looked like they were wiped out and scattered in exile, that in 538, under the Persians and Cyrus, King Cyrus, who was, had this more tolerant idea of letting, uh, instead of oppressing and suppressing different religions, he believed in freedom of religion. And so he wanted to lift, support the religion, indigenous religions. And so he supported the rebuilding of the temple and to return the Israelites back to their homeland. And so in 538 began the return of the exiles and the rebuilding of the temple And that's where pretty much after the exile is where the biblical record sort of ends around 400 BC. But then there's some stories that you'll find in other literature about the, uh, the Maccabean revolt, where under the oppression of the Greeks, the Persians and the Greeks oppressed them and oppressed this area and how the Greeks uh, wanted to control Israel by defaming them and actually having uh, sacrifices to Zeus and Greek gods instead of to the Jewish God or the, the true God of Israel. And so there was a revolt. And for a period of about four years, four or five years, the, there was something called the Hasmonean dynasty where the Jewish people uprose and where the, the story where Hanukkah, if you, if, you, if you know the Hanukkah story at all, comes from this period of the Maccabean revolt. But then the, another empire, the Roman Empire, came and ruled and over Israel or the region of Palestine, what we call Palestine, ruled over this area uh, before Christ and after Christ, and then in 70 AD, the Romans destroyed the temple of Israel, the second temple, and scattered the Jews. And there are other things that have happened on and off, but the temple, which represented the very presence of God to the Israelites, was destroyed in 70 AD and yet to be rebuilt but then in, and so Israel as, as a people did not have a nation until after World War II in 1948. The state of Israel was established after the Holocaust and so forth. And there's a, a, a long history of how that happened and I'm not here to talk about the long history, but the, my, my point in recounting some of the history of Israel is that Israel had its golden times. God raised up Israel as a people. They fell in sin. They went through times where they looked like they were devastated and destroyed. And they rose up again. They were almost destroyed. They rose up again. So Israel as a nation, as a specific people, had this, fall, you know, how God raised them up, they fell. How they raised them up, they fell. This is Israel according to the flesh. 
In Romans, Romans uh, 9, verse 6, For not all who descended from Israel belong to Israel, that the Apostle Paul is using Israel at least in two different sense. And you could even say it's either two or three. The third sense, you could say it might blend into the second sense. The first sense of the word Israel, all who descended from Israel, Israel according to the flesh, that trace their lineage back to the person of Israel, Jacob, the people of Israel that was formed under Moses, the nation of Israel, that which had a long history with the kings and the prophets, descended of Abraham, descended of Jacob. This is Israel according to the flesh. But then Paul distinguishes the Israel descended from, the, from Israel, descended according to the flesh. It says, not all who descended from Israel belong to Israel. And what that means is that there is the Israel according to the flesh, and there is another Israel. You can call it true Israel. Not all who descended from Israel belong to Israel. Now, which is this Israel? It's the true Israel. True Israel includes the remnant. Pastor Eddie preached on this about the remnant in chapter 11, verse 5. A remnant chosen by grace. In verse, chapter 11, verse 7, the, this true Israel is called the elect. In chapter 9, verse 8, they are called the children of the promise. And these, the remnant, the elect, the children of the promise, are actually, in fact, they are Israelites who believe in Jesus. So the true Israel are believers in Jesus but who descended from, from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They, they are Israelites according to the flesh, and they are believers in Jesus. They are the true Israel, the remnant. And it is not in chapter 11, but in Galatians 6.16, Paul makes the case that there is the Israel of God, he, as he's speaking to Christians in Galatia, both Jew and Gentile, he speaks to them with this phrase at the end of the book of Galatians, with this phrase, he doesn't explain it, so it's hard to know exactly what he means by this, but in chapter 16, or chapter 6, verse 16, in Galatians, he says, and as for all who walk by this rule, peace and mercy be unto them and upon the Israel of God. Who is this Israel of God? In Galatians chapter 3, verse, verse 7 So then, those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm reading verse 9. Uh, verse 7, know then that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. And so, the sons of Abraham are those of faith. And here, in Galatians, it's not just talking about those who are descended from Israel, the Jews who are of faith, the remnant, the elect of Israel, but it's talking about all who are of faith, Jews and Gentiles, are actually true Israel. You know, you might have sung that song in children's ministry Father Abraham had many sons. Many sons had Father Abraham. I am one of them, and so are you. So let's just praise the Lord. You know, there's the right arm. 
But that's all. We are not physical descendants of Abraham. But in the Bible, we, are, we enter into all the promises that are in Israel. So the Israel of God is the spiritual Israel of Jew, believing Jew, and believing Gentile. Who are the Gentiles? Uh, you might see this in verse 11, uh, chapter 11, verse 12 of Romans, where you see this phrase. Sorry, let me find that once again. Now, if their trespass means riches for the world, and if their failure means riches for the Gentiles, how much more will their full inclusion mean? So here what you have is the Gentiles is the world. Because what uh, if the trespasses means riches for the world, and if the failure means riches for the Gentiles, it's, it's sort of repeating. Who are the Gentiles? The Gentiles literally means the nations. Which nations? Every nation outside of the chosen nation, Israel being the chosen people, the chosen nation, and then everybody else. So the Gentiles are the nations, the nations that are not the chosen people. But those people who are not my people have become my people. That was said of that was said of uh, Israel. You are not my people, but you are now my people. But to the Gentiles, you who are not my people, you are now my people. This is said in First Timothy, uh, First Peter, chapter two, quoting from Hosea, the prophet Hosea, that you who are not my people are now my people. So the Gentiles are those who are once not God's people, but now in the New Testament are being included into the covenant promise. So the Gentiles are the nations of the world. And the nations of the world are now being brought in. And what Paul says is that why did Israel fall? Why did God allow Israel to fall? And he, he gives actually a reasoning here that God allowed Israel to fall. Well, he himself is, an, is a Jew, so he, it's not all that Israel fell, but most of Israel did not believe in Jesus. He says, why did this happen? Did God's promises fall? fail? No, God's promises didn't fail because there is the remnant But at the same time, not only the remnant, but God is causing that the the rejection of the Israelites is causing the Gentiles to be brought in. And if you think about this, that if Jesus was a Jew, the 12 disciples were Jewish, Paul himself was Jewish. If there was a great revival to Jesus among the Jews, maybe Christianity would have been a Jewish religion and that is it. In God's wisdom, he allowed for it not to be a revival among the Jews. Yes, there was the revival at Pentecost that were mostly Jewish, but God allowed a hardening among the Jews so that the world can come in. You know, as a a church, we're not a Korean church, but we're predominantly, you know, like if we had a certain culture that became so dominant it's hard for others to come in. And maybe God allowed certain things that certain things that look like why does why is there why is this happening? Why why is the Jews not believing in Christ? 
God has a purpose that we don't even know. And I could even use this argument that if you think about it, for in 1900, 1900, about 124 years ago, not about, 124 years ago, Christianity, 90% of Christianity was Western, was in Europe, was in uh, North America. But now today, uh, two-thirds of Christians are from um, what's, called, what's called the Global South. In Africa, in Latin America, in Asia, there's been growth of Christianity, where in the West, there has been a diminishing of Christianity. So we might think, you know, if we're living in America, we're living in Europe, you know, the Christianity looks like it's dying. Well, you're not getting the full picture. Christianity in the world is thriving. It's just dying around here. Not in every place, but in our culture. But does God allow in some ways that one culture that has been so dominant in Christianity to struggle so that others may come in. If you look at this, chapter 11, Paul is saying that. The, re the hardening of the Jews is allowing for the inclusion of the Gentiles. But he's looking forward in the future where the inclusion of the Gentiles is going to make, and I'm going to talk more about this next week, about the jealousy of Israel, but that the inclusion of the Gentiles is going to make Israel jealous. And through their jealousy, that they're going to come to Christ. Well, he doesn't use that phrase exactly, that they're going to come to Christ, but they are going to be included in the end that God will raise them up in the end. And this phrase, and if their failure, their failure to accept the Messiah means riches for the Gentiles, how much more will their full inclusion be, mean, exclamation point? Whose full inclusion not the Gentiles' full inclusion. It's, it's the inclusion of the Israel. All, so who, who is this Israel? Is it the Israel of God, Jews and Gentiles together? Yes. Is it Israel, the nation of Israel? It's not crystal clear here what he's meaning, but... Many people have seen that, that before Jesus Christ comes back, there will be a revival among the Jews, among those who are descendants of Abraham. And that's what I believe as well. And I long for that. There's a lot going on in Israel, and I'm, I'm not here to speak about uh, the political things that are going on in Israel today. You know, I, I think I, you guys know where I stand, and I've called us to pray for Israel and pray for the peace of Israel, and I support Israel, uh, the state of Israel today. However, my message to you is, when you think about this passage of how it could have been easily like, okay, the Jews, God raised up the Jews as God's chosen people. They did not receive it, and they are going to be rejected. But Romans 11 talks about a time where Israel will be raised again. And the raising of Israel, not that they would become a political power or, or some dominant force in this world, but that they would know Jesus Christ. That they would know the gospel that they would be at peace with God. They would, God raised them up, they fell. And the message of Romans 11 is that they will raise them up again. You know, in our church, uh, every Sunday, we stand, we sit, we stand up again. 
And then after the sermon, you stand up one more time and then you sit. <laughs> okay. We stand up three times. But really, it's the first two times that we're standing. And we sit once. And we stand twice. It's a, it's a simple little thing, but it, we are trying to enact the gospel. God is worthy of our praise, so we stand to worship him. Creation. We sit to confess fall. As we confess our sins, we hear the assurance of pardon that's in the gospel. We stand in assurance, redemption. Creation, God is worthy of all glory and honor. We fall in sin. We raise again in redemption. So rising, falling, rising again. And if you know the history of Israel, they did right. It shouldn't just be rising and falling and rising. It should be rising, falling, rising, falling, rising, falling many times. And if you look at your own life, God raises you up, you fall down. God raises you up, you fall down. And the promise of Romans 11 to Israel, God has not forsaken his people. He is accomplishing his purpose. God cannot be mocked. So when we sin and fall away, and we will bear the consequences, but God cannot be unfaithful. God will be faithful. We don't know exactly how he does it, but we know that God will always be faithful in his time, in his way. And so when we rise and fall and rise and fall, and when you think about actually people, like think about this. Maybe there are people in your life that you think about and you say, you know, they were once a Christian and they, they fell. They fell away. And you grieve like the way Paul grieved for his fellow Jews as they did not accept Jesus. They hardened their heart. But Paul says, this hardening was temporary. And this cannot necessarily mean every single person. But we know that God is faithful. You don't know. R.C. Sproul said, you don't know someone is not elect until they die. If they died in unbelief, then you know they're not elect. But before they die, you don't know if they're going to rise back up again. If they've fallen away from the Lord, they might return again. So think about this gospel lesson. Israel was raised up by God. They failed. And then God raised them up. They failed. And on the last day, God will be faithful to his promises and he will raise them up again. And this message is for us as well. And especially if we feel like we've fallen until you die, it's not too late. God can raise you up. And if you have a loved one who seems like they've fallen away and they feel like you feel like it's hopeless, Remember this promise that he made to Israel. Who is Israel? It's the true believers. You don't know until someone dies if they are elect or not. Now, if someone's a true believer, you can know and assume that they're elect by their faith. But if someone doesn't believe, don't assume that they're not believers, they're non-elect because until they die in unbelief, you will not know. So we hope 
for their rising. And when you find yourself stumbling and falling, God will uphold you. One of my favorite chapters of the Psalms is Psalm 37, verse 24 in the NIV. And uh, ESV has a slightly different translation, but the NIV, it says this about the righteous man. Though he may stumble, he will not fall, for the Lord upholds him with his hand. The ESV actually translate the word falling as, as no stumbling as falling. Though he fall, he will not fall headlong. That's the ESV. Meaning that though you fall, you will not be utterly destroyed. But the idea here is though you stumble, you will not ultimately fall. Your fall will not be ultimate. God will uphold you by the righteous right hand. And this is the promise, I believe, that the Apostle Paul is holding on to for Israel, God's people, the remnant and the elect, and that God would, in one day before Christ returns, that there will be a revival and a renewal among the people of Israel. And that's my prayer. Let's pray together.